Which of these 64 dividend aristocrats will advance from the Elite Eight to the Final Four? In today's video, we're going to talk about it. This video is for educational purposes only. It should not be considered investment, legal, or tax advice. It is not an offer to buy or sell any security. Past performance does not indicate future results. Investing is risky. Today's video is sponsored by Magic Mind. Magic Mind is the world's first productivity shot. Magic Mind has real ingredients backed by science. For example, the caffeine source is matcha, which not only contains 130 times the antioxidants of regular green tea, which is already very good for you, but it provides just enough caffeine to give you that natural boost, but also contains a special substance called L-theanine, which can reduce the stress and anxiety and jitteriness that often comes from consuming coffee. It also contains ingredients that I cannot possibly pronounce, like Bacapa Maniri, which science suggests supports attention, cognitive processing, and your working memory. And other ingredients that you see here, each one of them comes with its own studies that you can actually check out and see the scientific research behind that particular ingredient. Use the link in the description below and type in the discount code WINKLEPLEK20 at checkout. You will get a discount on your very first order, saving $51 if you sign up for a monthly subscription, which will deliver 30 bottles of Magic Mind to your door. And now back to the Elite Eight. As a reminder, what I did was started with the 64 dividend aristocrats, which are those companies that have at least 25 consecutive years of dividend growth. I then ranked those by the highest 64 market caps. We're currently down to the Elite Eight, and in each round we've focused on a different metric for determining the winner. So for example, in the first round, we looked at competitive advantage. In the second round, we looked at different valuation metrics. And then to get to the Elite Eight, we looked at specifically dividend metrics. But in today's video, we're going to use a software called New Constructs. And what New Constructs does is basically an institutional level research platform that uses AI to go into financial statements and actually corrects them based upon uh, things like the footnotes, the MD&A uh, commentary, anything that would actually help you get a better idea of what the actual earnings power of a business is, instead of potentially accounting manipulations or other irregularities that actually make earnings look higher than they really are. Full disclosure, New Constructs did give me a subscription to their platform for free, but they are not sponsoring this video. They are not giving me any payment for this. I don't even have an affiliate link in the description down below. So bottom line, I have no financial reason to promote new constructs. I just like the service and I'm interested in seeing what the real earnings of these businesses are. I think that may help us come up with a higher quality final four. So let's get into the first matchup. We have Sherwin-Williams versus Nextera. So here we have Sherwin-Williams on the left and Nextera on the right. And let's quickly go through the different valuation metrics that New Constructs includes on the dashboard. The market implied gap is essentially telling us how many years is the stock market predicting that they are going to maintain a competitive advantage. And that is defined as having the return on invested capital greater than the weighted average cost of capital. So in both cases, the stock market is expecting these companies to maintain a competitive advantage for over 100 years. So the market is implying that both of these are extremely elite businesses. So ideally, we want this number to be as low as possible. So in this case, it's a tie. Also in valuation, they look at the price relative to their economic book value calculation, which is a customized formula that they use that helps correct for different balance sheet irregularities. So Sherwin-Williams at a 2.5 is significantly better than Nextera, which shows a 9.9. Free cash flow yield is also in Sherwin Williams' favor. Now, just to take note, they actually include the acquisitions in this free cash flow. So, a business that just made a big acquisition will get penalized for that. I don't think that's entirely fair uh, for them to do that, but uh, we'll, we'll just leave it alone. In this case, again, Sherwin Williams wins with a free cash flow yield at 1% relative to NextEra at a negative 6%. Returns on invested capital are uh, modified. They actually modify these using their custom uh, income statement calculations. So this is uh, should be a more true estimate of what the returns on capital actually are. 
Sherman Williams uh, wins again, 13 versus four for next era. And the most interesting thing that I think New Constructs does is calculate this economic versus reported earnings per share. And ideally, the closer this number, the better. So in this case, Sherman Williams reported earnings are $8.15, but they calculate their economic earnings, which means they took out any you know, one-time asset purchases or any footnotes that disclosed uh, you know, some specific uh, change that should not be reflected in actual earnings. They come up with a $5.09. But if we look at Nextera, you can actually see that their economic earnings, according to new constructs, is negative $1.23 per share versus reported $3.36. So let's take a deeper look at this economic versus reported earnings per share. Here in the dotted red lines are what Sherman Williams reported. The blue is what new constructs calculated was the economic reality. So a couple red flags. One, there is a gap between these two numbers, which you'll find is the case for most companies. But the second thing to note is that the economic earnings are actually slightly trending lower, whereas the reported earnings are actually trending a little higher. However, relative to next era, this looks significantly better. The economic earnings were only positive in 2020. In every other period over the last five years, next era has reported negative economic earnings per share, whereas the reported numbers have been uh, pretty good. And again, we see the trend from 2020 through trailing 12 months is up for reported, but down for new constructs calculation. And then perhaps most importantly, they report the return on invested capital for each business relative to its weighted average cost of capital. So any business that has a competitive advantage should have a difference between these two numbers, whereas their return on capital is greater than the cost of producing that capital. So we see that with Sherman Williams. However, Nextera has consistently had a weighted average cost of capital greater than its return on capital. So based on that data, I think it's a clear victory for Sherman Williams. Next, we have ADP versus Canadian Railway. Again, we see that ADP, the market is predicting that they will maintain a competitive advantage for over 100 years. Based on ADP's historic numbers, I think that is a reasonable assumption. However, they're only paying for Canadian National Railway to cover their weighted average cost of capital for 16 years. So that could be a good or a bad thing, depending on your assessment of the business. But all else being equal, definitely this is more favorable. CNI also trades for a lower price to economic book value and a higher free cash flow yield. But where we start to see ADP take the advantage is in both return on invested capital, which is 34%, very impressive for ADP, puts it in the top quintile of all stocks in their universe, whereas CNI is only generating 11%. We also have a much better picture on economic versus reported earnings for ADP versus Canadian National. The ADP on the left, you can see there is still a slight gap between the economic EPS and the reported EPS. However, they generally trend in the same direction, and perhaps most importantly, they are both trending up. We also see returns on capital for ADP have maintained and perhaps even widened over the last couple of years, whereas most companies, including CNI, that gap has narrowed. CNI also has a much larger gap between their reported earnings and economic earnings. We also see the same role in economic earnings that we saw uh, with the last two stocks. So despite looking a little bit cheaper, I think we have to go with ADP here. I think it's trading at a premium valuation because it is a premium stock. And this next example is where I think we see new constructs really shine as far as its ability to potentially help you avoid a major bad decision. So throughout this entire tournament, I've been very surprised by FDS. It seems to show exceptionally well on almost all metrics. However, when you look behind the curtains and into the footnotes and MDA, uh, apparently things aren't quite as good. Just based on the dashboard, you can see that the difference between Lowe's and FactSet is night and day. The market is only paying for 12 years of competitive advantage for Lowe's. The price to book is half what it is for fact set. Free cash flow yield is four relative to an astounding negative eight for fact set. And most of this, to be fair, is from an acquisition. But even excluding the acquisition, free cash flow yield is better for lows. 
Both of these names score in the top quintile for return on invested capital. However, you'll notice that the comparison between the returns on invested capital as reported by FactSet and has actually found by new constructs is significantly lower at just 17%. Still impressive, but not nearly as good as it seems on the surface. Lowe's is better at 24%. This is where things really fall apart for FactSet. Their economic versus reported earnings were moving in about the same direction with a fairly small gap. However, that gap over the last 12 months has widened significantly, which is concerning, suggesting that perhaps they are doing things in the footnotes and in the MDNA to mask what earnings actually should be, which is apparently heading in the wrong direction. We also see returns on invested capital absolutely plummeting at the same time the weighted average cost of capital for FactSet and basically every other company is starting to increase. So back in 2020, the gap was 21%, whereas now it's down to less than 10%. This suggests their competitive advantage may be starting to erode. And we compare that to Lowe's, the gap has shrunk just a bit as weighted average cost of capital has increased. However, they are maintaining the returns on capital. And for the first time, we actually see a company where the economic earnings are higher than the reported earnings, which is a very good sign. So in this case, I think if we were looking at just the regular financial statements, we might have gone with FactSet, but in this case, it's very obvious that we should go with Lowe's. In our final matchup, we have Procter & Gamble versus McDonald's. So here we have two real dividend heavyweights. It's really kind of a shame that one of these is going to have to lose. So the market implied gap, again, lower is better, favors Procter & Gamble at 16 versus 40. PG also trades at a lower price to economic book and a higher free cash flow yield. So as far as just pure cheapness, Procter & Gamble is clearly the winner. However, when we consider the returns on capital and economic versus reported earnings, this is where McDonald's starts to shine. It's in the top quintile for returns on capital at 19%, and the economic versus reported earnings are much more favorable relative to PG. You can see that for McDonald's, the reported and economic earnings have maintained a pretty similar trajectory over time, whereas PG has historically diverged a bit more and that gap is starting to widen along with economic earnings starting to decline. We also see that the return on invested capital relative to weighted average cost of capital is starting to shrink pretty significantly, whereas McDonald's has been able to increase theirs over time and maintain this advantage. And this is where it gives you the opportunity to actually go in and assess why the returns on capital are doing what they're doing. So this is a DuPont model analysis. Again, we have PG on the left, McDonald's on the right. And the reason why you see these returns on capital for PG starting to suffer is very clearly here in this uh, net operating profit after tax margin. So in 2021, Procter & Gamble's margins were nearly 20%. Lately, however, that has fallen to 17.7. On the other hand, we see McDonald's margins starting to actually increase. So about 37% in 2021, all the way up to nearly 39% over the trailing 12-month period. So this suggests that Procter & Gamble does not quite have the same pricing power uh, that McDonald's has. McDonald's, I know, is implementing a ton of new technology in their restaurants. And just relative to the rest of the restaurant industry, I think McDonald's has a much better competitive advantage than Procter & Gamble does in its space. So this is a close matchup, but I think McDonald's, we have to favor that based upon that competitive edge. So there we have our final four. All four of these are very elite businesses, but in the next video in the series, we'll do a more in-depth dive into each one of these and see which one brings home the championship. Thank you to everyone who is currently supporting me on YouTube Premium and Patreon. I'm still working on finding a custodian for the new coffee can portfolios. I will be sharing which stocks I bought for that portfolio when I get that completed. I'm currently looking at Schwab and Fidelity as potential options for that. At the end of this month, we'll be reviewing the quarterly performance for all of those different portfolios. I also had a question from a subscriber, from a supporter actually, uh, asking if I could make a more simple way uh, to show my past content. 
And so I'm going to be working on that a little bit, just getting things a little bit more organized so that hopefully uh, you'll be able to find all of the content. Thanks to everyone for supporting the channel. Let me know in the comment section which of the final four candidates do you think is going to be the champion? Also, if you have any other ideas for future content, let me know down below. Love to get your ideas and provide some, some information, some education that you really want to hear. Thanks for watching the video and I will see you in the next one.